It's so good to be here, and um, it's so nice to be invited um, back somewhere. So having met everyone at the Connecticut Lit Festival, and then to be invited back is such an honor. So thank you for having me. This is a beautiful room. It's a beautiful day, and um, I hope you guys enjoy the reading. So uh, for those that don't know, my book is really about a pivotal moment um, growing up in Queens as a Chinese immigrant. Um, my parents owned sweatshops growing up, um, and then my mother put me to work in a sweatshop, and I happened to call child services when I was 15. So um, this book, a lot of it is really about that pivotal moment and sort of what happens after the reconciliation. Um, so I will read some of the opening. Um, and then maybe I'll skip around, and I will actually don't want to read for too long because I know that everybody's attention is probably about 20, 25 minutes long. So <laughs> I'm going to milk that. Um, I don't think you'll need to know anything. I'm just going to read the opening, which opens in the sweatshop. The seven train flooded with natural light as we emerged from underground and Long Island City's graffitied rooftops, pre-war buildings, and brick warehouses come into view. The commute from school to my parents' garment factory in Queens was a 25-minute bus ride, a transfer, and then another 35 minutes on the subway. After stepping off the packed train, I walked down a sidewalk lined with abandoned warehouses, their windows cloudy, cloudy, cracked, and boarded up with pieces of plywood. Unmarked trucks and vans pass once in a while. Three long blocks from the station, a large commercial dumpster sat in front of a pair of dark green double doors. No one went in or out, and there was no way to see inside, but I knew the place. I worked here every day after school and on weekends. It was my latest punishment. I used my body as leverage to pull on the metal door. Immediately, even before I was fully in, a gust of stale air lifted the hair off my shoulders and neck and whipped it around my face. Goosebumps ran along my arms and the back of my neck. The door slammed shut behind me with a mechanic thud, and the calmness outside disappeared, and the sounds of a working factory took over. A few tall windows brought in natural light while the rest of the warehouse lay in shadow. The sewing machine section, the only area with any direct lighting, was busy with women wearing disposable masks over their mouths and forearm coverings. The mask protected against the debris and pollutants in the air, and the oversleeves protected their arms from the heat of the lamps. From where I stood, I could see two rows of sewing, sewing tables, each slightly larger than a school desk, illuminated by individual lamps. Light, lighting was key to speed and safety here. As the women leaned on the pedals at their feet, their bodies lurched forward in a soft concave, meeting the rhythm of rapid stitches at their fingers. Two shades of maroon thread turned at their spool pins. Once in a while, a hand shot out, tugged on a thread and unspooled a spindle. I rarely saw faces, only the tops of their backs, circular spotlights exposing the whiteness of their necks. The only memory I had of the factory before becoming a worker was on Chinese New Year, the one day of the year my parents closed shop. My mother, my half-siblings, Henry and Jill, and I came early in the morning to stuff gift bags. We formed an assembly line. I was at the head a reluctant Henry stood next to me, followed by Jill and their mother. And then my mother. She licked, she sat licking the tip of her index finger, peeling crisp 20s and sealing them in red envelopes. It was hard to keep Henry working for more than a few minutes at a time, but Jill, a year younger than him, loved chores and tasks. She tossed a handful of red candy into each plastic bag, one eye always on our mother, seeking assurance and approval. I remember the warehouse feeling cavernous, cold, and quiet. 
Our voices carried over the entire space. The vast size made us giddy, nervous. I remember running from the echoes that lurked in the shadows like waiting ghosts. We raced back to our mother and back to complete our task. A running factory filled with workers was worlds apart from the deserted warehouse where we played Chinese Santa Claus. But from the number of gift bags we put together, I knew there were about 50 regular employees. There was no way to count the people in the factory now, tucked behind and around the, the machines, moving from one station to another. The enormity of the warehouse intimidated me still. A long thread landed in the corner of my mouth and I wiped my face with the back of my sleeve. Industrious metal fans strategically placed around the warehouse circulated flat, hot air. The constant turbulence was meant to provide relief, but instead it annoyed and unsettled. Trash, loose thread, plastic, lint, and pieces of fabric migrated from nearby surfaces, surfaces, crevices, and floors, revolving in the air until they caught on something or someone. I looked over to the office, where my mother was most likely doing inventory, planning new projects, or handling, handling payroll. Then I headed in the opposite direction. I passed an old, dank fridge next to a small island with an off-white microwave and a commercial-sized rice cooker that could feed all the workers. Past the kitchen was a women's restroom. A light bulb flickered on and off, then on again. The smell of ammonia mingled with rice and leftovers hit me as I passed by. To my left, I paused as an older Chinese man shouted urgently to a younger man, his voice drowned out by the hiss of the steam press they operated. It was a father and son, or an uncle and nephew. I wasn't sure which, but they were close enough to my station that I was familiar with their routine. They operated a commercial steamer with an extended hose on a tall rack for garments. Steam rode, rose out of a wide head or out of the large iron setting on the, resting on the oversized board. Their station was one of the reasons the factory was always hotter and more humid than it was outside. The father manned the machine, the more dangerous job, while the son ran inventory, pulling clothing off the steamer hook or iron press, and then quickly folding and packaging them in boxes. Their speed and intimacy made it look easy, but they were both drenched and swept. Up close, they were older than I thought. The older man could have been in his 50s. He lifted a lever and quickly moved out of the way. Steam rose in a white cloud above them and was swiftly picked out by the fans, leaving a metallic humidity in the air. The smell reminded me of the first day we turned the heat on in the winter. The sun swooped in and lifted the shirt off the press. Each piece was newly starched and pressed before they left the factory. He worked hastily, turning to lift the next shirt off. A sh short, weathered Chinese man hurried by, dumping black trash bags of fabric and thread a few feet from where I stood. It was Mr. Wang, my mother's eyes and ears. I pulled another loose thread from my lip and picked up my pace. Hip-hop music was coming from my station as I approached. Six women stood around a long wood table, each handle, holding a bundle of fabric in their hand. The cutting girls, as I like to call them, shifted and made room for me. I dropped my Jansport book, Jansport book bag on the concrete floor and felt something wrap around my ankle. We stood close to two fans, and they often blew fabric, thread, and pieces of paper off the table and onto us. Without glancing down, I used my free leg to kick whatever it was off. One of the younger women, the gesture in the group, was swaying from one side to another and humming. She always drew smiles and laughter from the other women. Once in a while, she'd hear a song that got her dancing. Her energy was so contagious, she could get the whole team moving to the same rhythm. I gave her a quick smile as I pulled my hair from my face and up in a ponytail in preparation for my work. My job was to cut loose thread off half-completed or finished articles of clothing. 
An unfamiliar mountain of maroon fabric sat at the center of the table. We must have received a new order this morning. I motioned at an older woman at the end of the table with my free hand. If new inventory came in and I was at school, she showed me what to do. She seemed to be the natural leader of the table. She often quieted us if we grew too playful and garnered looks from other workers. She moved slowly, but somehow managed to accomplish tasks nimbly and effective, efficiently. Tranquilo, she said during her first weekend I worked. She put her hand over my scissors and gave them a shake. I was working too fast, giving myself another blister. I wanted the long day to be over, but she understood something I didn't. Moving faster didn't make the day go faster. If we finished this project, there would be another. There would always be another project. Tranquilo, she said one final time. Our group worked on orders as a collective. Some orders took a couple of days, while others took weeks or a month to complete. We never knew how many more days, how many more bundles of fabric were left, or if there was a deadline. There was a large bin near the table, and as long as that bin was filled, we had work to do. It was our job to keep our heads down, do the work, and not ask questions. The rules at the factory weren't so different from the rules at home. And I think I will move to a different section and take a sip of water. So you guys, I actually made that um, opening extra long for a reason. So the rest of the book actually reads much faster, but that, the opening, I wanted a long intro in and I wanted, um, that first scene to be very immersive so that by the time you finished that scene, you knew exactly where you were. So I am gonna read. I read a really short section and then I will move on to a different section. This is the joy of not having to share the reading time with anyone else. I get to read as much as I like. <laughs> okay, this is a short section. I've never been very good at waiting. As a toddler, after my mother left me with Ninye and Az, my grandparents, to follow the path to the American dream, I learned to wait for her return. I waited through breaths, meals, baths, fights with Az, rides on my bikes. I waited until wounds from my scrapes scabbed and healed, until my hair grew long enough for two tight braids, until holes spread in my underwear. As a child, every year stretched longer than the life I had lived, and soon I could no longer remember what it felt like to have a mother, only what it was like to be without one. Kala, Kala, they said, soon, soon. They were the soothers, my grandmother, aunts, cousins, even my mother over the static landline. Neighbors and Ninia's friends joined in, balancing their tongues on the roofs of their mouths to make the same sound until they played on a loop in my head. Kala, Kala. When the neighborhood boys taunted me because I was fatherless and now motherless, I repeated the words in my mind like a mantra, Kala. Kala. No one knew how long it would take for her to return, not even my mother. Time passed as it does. Pity turned into stretches of silence, and silence turned into awkwardness and avoidance. I was a girl without parents, a father dead, a mother who left Winzhou, China to start a new life. The waiting for my mother's failed promise steeped like tea, growing dark and bitter, coloring everything and finding its way into my interactions with others. I took it out on my grandparents, on girls trying to be my friends, on boys who refused to be my friends. I was wild, angry, and resentful of the community that took pity on me because Kala had turned into five years and the cadences of their hushed voices now told me my mother would never 
come. So I read maybe one more section. This one, one of the things that I was really important to me about writing this book was also portraying um, some of the class issues when it comes to um, illegal immigrants and communities. Um, so this is about um, my extended family. Two of my cousins immigrated to New York City around the time I finally assimilated to elementary school. Our family rarely went to visit my aunt, but we did soon after she bought her kids over from China. It was a joyous occasion, like the party my parents threw when I first arrived, which is in an earlier scene. For years, my aunt and uncle saved and worked overtime so that their reunion could be possible. It was painful, but common, for parents to leave China without their children. Grandparents, aunts and uncles, friends and neighbors stepped in to take care of them. In exchange, money was sent home monthly to cover costs. Often it was enough to improve the lives of the children and those relatives. The separation allowed parents to settle into their new American surroundings unburdened. They slept in tight quarters with other newly immigrated workers, often on floors, on thin mattresses. It was easier to find housing, to work impossibly long days, and to save money without a family. There was no room for children, no money for childcare, and those factors overrode any sentimentality over separation. Separation may have been commonplace, but having your kids with you was a rite of passage a reinforced incentive on a road toward prosperity and the American dream. To have your children with you was a talked about privilege. I didn't remember my cousins. We were children from different worlds by then. I vaguely recognized the girl. She was a year older and the, the boy was a year younger than me. We had grown up playing together as toddlers. They had a startled, fresh off the boat meekness their frightened expression, so familiar and undisguised, it hurt my eyes. Their clothes was coarse, cheap, poorly made, and screamed made in China, and ran large over their thin, undernourished frames. Being around them made me feel self-conscious, made me remember who I was when I arrived, the same un-Americanness that, that kids at schools made fun of the Chinese part of myself I thought I had eradicated. I walked around my aunt's cramped one bedroom, pacing, listening to my mother praise how much space they had. Was she joking? I couldn't believe she was saying the place was nice. All the furniture was plastic except for the kitchen table and the bed. The wobbly table and plastic chairs were uncomfortable and cheap. The floor had vintage looking tiles that had been bleached until they were a different color and still looked unclean. The bathroom had plastic bins in the tub, dark circles on the ceiling and baggy underwear hanging over the curtain rod. It smelled of moisture and mildew. Though we were all immigrants, my extended family led more difficult lives. It was painfully obvious. They worked as hard as my parents, but they had less and saved hardly anything at all. Do you know English? I asked my cousins when it was clear there was nothing else to do. My cousins shook their head in unison. They looked alike. The girl had a short pixie cut that made her features more delicate, and the boy was all bones. How about Mandarin? I pressed. I was not used to having more than others, and I chose the moment as an opportunity to gloat. They shook their head again. Do you know how to read? I taunted. We're going to school soon, the older one said, speaking up and putting a protective arm around her brother. I nodded at her. It's hard, but you can learn. She squeezed her brother. He didn't pull away and seemed to come out of his shell a bit. 
I looked over at Henry and Jill playing by themselves and staying close to our parents. They had no interest in talking to our cousins or to me. You can't wear the same clothes from China to school every day. They'll make fun of you. Why not? The younger one whispered so lightly I could barely hear him. He seemed more affected by the situation than his sister. This is America, I, sim I stated simply, and then quickly added, ask your ma to buy some more. We looked over at my aunt. They hadn't seen their mother in years, but even at their age, they knew there was no money. It should have been enough to make it to America, but they would soon realize it was not. It would, they would need school supplies, new clothes, a separate room to grow up in. They would compare themselves with kids in school who were more fortunate than them, kids that learned English faster, parents that had more than their parents. We were silent, too aware of the impossibilities of our lives. At least they remembered their parents, I thought. At least they had only been separated for two years and not five, like my mother and me. At least they didn't have a new family when they got here. Even though I knew the struggle they would face, I felt longing and something close to envy. I looked at the way they huddled together. At least they had each other. I decided I liked them. I grabbed the girl's hand and tried to get in between them. The younger one refused to let go of his sister's hand. I pried his finger off one by one, his grip tight and white around the knuckle. His face darkened and contorted with each finger I pulled away. When he seemed about ready to cry, I looked over at my mother in conversation with my aunt. She would never let me join their family. Okay, okay, don't cry, I said, letting go. And that's 20, uh, let me do one more reading. <laughs> I think we have time, maybe one more. I'll end with a, a happy moment, which there aren't many in the book, but uh, I found some. <laughs> um, in 2012, my mother came to my first graduation ceremony. I was 28 years old and in getting my MFA. She came alone. My stepfather, having learned from Henry and Jill that I wrote nonfiction, was not coming, and neither were they. It made little to no difference in my life since we rarely spoke, I told myself, but I still cried after she told me. My mother showed up with an armful of red roses that were the largest I'd ever seen. She looked tiny and stricken in comparison. She had taken a cab from Queens all the way to Westchester, a Jingma ride that cost well over $100. I could see that she was shaking from nerves. She hated being in unfamiliar situations. The day was a blur as I placed her with my roommate's parents and joined in, the row, in a row of smiling and overstimulated graduates. I turned back to check on her, just like my roommates with their families. It was, it was silly how deliriously happy I was. Maybe we had turned a new leaf, I thought, my mother, the only person I'd ever needed and wanted was here at my graduation. It should have been too little, too late, but instead it felt like a dream I'd once had coming true. I felt like the rest of my classmates for once, with family, in the crowd, celebrating our achievements. I couldn't stop smiling. I looked around at the faces of writers that would go on to publish poems, chapbooks, essays, novels, and memoirs. Our future felt equally bright for once. After the ceremony, I took her to Underhill Crossing, a small restaurant in Bronxville where I waited tables when I wasn't writing or in class. She sat, she sat stiffly in her chair and left her menu untouched on the table. I'm not hungry, she said. You order whatever you want. I ordered a salad and fish tacos, not fully understanding her restraint until it hit me. She couldn't read anything on the menu. We hadn't gone out for a meal together in years and never to a non-Chinese restaurant. 
I open my menu again, rushing to explain each dish. How did you say charred in Chinese? This is for you, she says abruptly, interrupting my description of the charred octopus appetizer I thought she'd like. She handed me a red box. It looked like all of the Chinese jewelry boxes she kept in her ivory vanity table. Inside was an amber ring with a thick silver band. It's the style you like, right? You are the first person in our family to graduate from college and now graduate school. I had to come today, even if no one else would come with me. I knew education wasn't as important to our family as survival, as money, and in those ways, I had been rebellious, but I was surprised. How could I be the first in our family to graduate from college? I wanted to ask about my extended family, all of the cousins I was out of touch with. Their names were on the tip of my tongue, but I could only recall my cousin at the bar, which is also an earlier scene. Yes, I said, slipping on the ugly ring. Thank you. In my mother's eyes, I had beaten the odds. I was not like my cousins from China or my half-siblings. I had charged ahead on my own and taken a path she could not have imagined for me. Maybe this was her way of telling me she was proud. Celebration, she said in broken English. In my undergrad, I went to uh, SUNY Binghamton, um, and you know, I studied creative writing. I was also an Asian American studies double major. Um, I wanted to write, but I really didn't feel like I ha had the privilege to make that happen. For me, um, financial security had been drilled into my head for so long, um, and in so many you know, different ways as well, that it really took me a long time to even, you know, face myself in terms of recognizing that I wanted to write this memoir. Um, I think in a lot of ways I felt um, this was one of the only ways I could find my own voice and um, find that validation I was looking for in my youth. And so I just chipped away at it. I would say, I lived with my mother from the age of seven to 17. I would say I spent then 10 years sort of just recovering from it. And then I spent another 10 years crafting this book. So I would say that's the journey. Um, I think you do have to, um, you know, I went through a lot of therapy um, and I highly recommend therapy for anyone and everyone. Um, but yeah, it's been a long, long process. I feel very fortunate in that um, I've felt very supported by, I think one of the few lucky things looking back is that you know I did grow up middle class. I did not grow up poor, like um, my extended family on my mother's side. Um, and that, you know, there was a different trajectory. I got to go to college and then I got to go to grad school and I was able to pursue all of the education I wanted without, um, really without um, concern for other people in my family in terms of supporting other people, I think, which is a huge privilege. Um, it, it is a huge privilege to be able to process the traumas of our generation, but also our parents' tra traumas. Um, I think, you know, and we all have this in common, whether we're, you know, first generation immigrants or second generation. Um, at some point, people in our family came to this country and um, they didn't come with a blank slate. They came with a ton of emotional baggage. Usually, you know, Hopefully they weren't refugees, but they were escaping their situation for one reason or another, right? So they were looking for security, they were looking for safety, whatever it was. And that, you know, we don't talk about that enough. They come into um, their new situation and often the immediate things you think about are, you know, roof over your head and food to eat and way to find a work. You don't think at all of like, oh, 
the emo we need to deal with this person's emotions and how much trauma that they've gone through you know like even when i came when i was seven i think it would have been really really helpful to sort of been integrated into things but i was not integrated I was just sort of tossed in and i remember all the way up until sixth grade you know my english scores were terrible I was so ashamed of it because I had no one to help me with homework and um, there's just a lot of cultural misunderstandings like my, my parents never really came to PTA because they were always working at the factory until you know and I remember the teachers being like well I have evening hours like at six and I'm like my parents don't come home until at least eight like it's just um, so yeah yeah Yes, there are so many memoirs that have inspired me. Um, you know, I was thinking about this a lot in terms of like what, um, and I think uh, this is what I tell my students too, you know, when we write, we're not just, um, we're not just writing something from us, we're adding to an entire conversation that's been happening for a very, very long time, right? So, for example, if you're writing about women's studies, like, you're entering into a conversation that's been around for a very, very long time. If you're writing any books, you're entering into a conversation with, um, you know, those themes or those, um, whatever the, that struggle is in your in your work. And I think it's really important to recognize that there is a lot of history before you. Um, and so for me, reading, you know, was my first way into writing. Um, I remember the first Asian American book I read, which was, um, which is funny because I was confused by it, was uh, The Good Earth by Pearl S. Buck. And I didn't understand why the author's name was was Pearl S. Buck, and I was like, the, why is a white person writing uh, an Asian story? Um, and it was really interesting to me that, um, you know, I've always had trouble finding like examples for, for myself in terms of writing and memoir. Um, but I would say some of my favorite work, um, Melissa Phoebos is a, a fantastic writer. I think there's a lot happening around her work. She just won the National Book of Prize uh, for um, Girlhood. Um, she's doing a lot of community activism. I, I love the idea of writing, in uh, writing into the genre that you want to see change. So write, writing as a way of resistance, as a way of justice, as a way of writing against injustice when our voices are not heard. And, um, and also maybe when you know, when people aren't ready for your story. Um, you know, when this book came out, which was in August, so not that long ago, maybe four or five people had known about what happened in this book. And it wasn't so much that I kept it, you know, a secret. It was that I had learned over my childhood and early adolescence that there, there really wasn't, it wasn't something that people were open to hearing. Um, that people, you know, have their own lives to live and, and um, you know, and so that's also another driving force for me just to put a lot of things on paper that people didn't want to hear but was so a part of my everyday and it felt so vital to my life. Um, but I stopped talking about it. Um, so I think this book was, you know, a big surprise to a lot of people that knew me too because I think you wouldn't expect that kind of history from the way I present myself. And that's, you know, all because of assimilation, you can really break it down. Made in China was actually um, one of the stories in my thesis. Um, and I pulled it out of the thesis because I was interested in writing a memoir and I thought it was, was the most tangible a sliver of something that I could write about, which means that, you know, memoir has changed a lot in the last 40 years. Um, you know, it used to be that you could write your entire life story in a memoir, and that is definitely not the case anymore. I would say, you know, for example, as soon as E. Pray Love came out, um, 
it, you know, it changed the time frame of when memoir takes place. So for example, her book is uh, three months in India in Indonesia and in, in I think Italy, right? So um, then there was Wild, which was about the Pacific Crest Trail, which also was about six months. So there's really, um, if you look at memoir, there's another one, um, this book called Hurry Down Sunshine, which is about a, a father who writes about his daughter's psychotic break at the age, I think of like 17 or 18. And really from the beginning to the end of the book, it's really a month's time. So really thinking about memoir as a sliver of time because you want the readers to really experience what it was like and you can't get into details like the way I do if you know you're trying to write 50 years of history or 30 years of history. Um, so I ended up um, picking this piece and I would say the first draft took me about two years to write and then Oh man, there's been so many drafts. For myself, uh, meaning before I showed it to anyone, I went through three drafts, then I got an agent, and then with her, we went through it for eight months, and I there was three rounds of edits, so considerable. And then with um, Catapult, who is my publisher, um, again, three really big rounds of big rounds of edits. So I would say, you know, N at least nine life-changing, book-changing drafts of this. Um, and I would say, you know, it's, at, in the end, it's been such a collaborative work. You, there is a sense of you, you have to let it go. So what I mean by that is, you know, I worked on this book by myself for about five, six years. It's a long time to hold on to a piece of work and not really share it. And then once you share it, and especially after the book is sold, um, you can't be too precious about it. You sort of have to go with the changes that come, the edits that are being ask, asked of you. And then um, it becomes more of a collaborative project, right? It's collaboration between you and your editor, and it's a collaboration after you've had this collaboration with your agent. So it goes through a number of different um, uh, it's gone through so many versions that honestly it's hard it's it's hard for me to even remember you know at what point certain things were taken out and what points things were ch changed because it went through a lot um i would say that this is maybe you know it, it it's a short book it's just over 200 pages and i would say probably half of the book was cut so a lot of the book was cut yeah and, and, you know, and each time it was cut, I sort of wrote into it again. So, um, you know, yeah, it's been, it was a very interesting process. Hard process, very difficult. Um, what I was trying to point out is like, when, when you're writing memoir, it's, sometimes it's hard to um, allow other people to edit your work. Um, because you sat with it for so long. Um, so that was definitely challenging. Because like also with your, you know, I we sold the book um, to an agent that I really admired, but I didn't really know her. We had met maybe one time when she bought the book. So it's to trust someone with your, and in, in my case, it was my life's work, to make the right edits is just a, a, a big leap of faith. And I think that um, there's always that leap of faith um, when you're publishing a book, I think. Waiting for the reception as well, that's a huge leap of faith. So I, I've thought about this deeply. <laughs> so thank you for asking that. For example, um, there were things I ended up having to push back on. And at that time, um, it was crunch time, right? Like. We were four months out from when the book was gonna come out, so I had less than a month to get this draft back to my editor, and she wanted a lot of things cut that I was like, oh my God, you can't cut this. Like, this is such a huge emotional heart of this book. And, excuse me, and that was actually, um, I learned some things about emotional intelligence in the process, actually, that um, if, you know, when you go through so much of a recovery um, and you've really um, been very careful about um, 
you, a lot of this book is about trauma and um, transgenerational trauma, but also recovering from trauma. So there's a, there's an emotional journey for sure. And um, I think the emotional journey for me versus how the editor wanted it is completely different. You and your editor, you know, have the same goal. You want the success of the book, but but it besides that, it's very different goals. For me, I wanted the most, you know, beautiful book possible that, and I wanted um, points that maybe wasn't so clearly articulated to be clearly articulated. So I wanted her help in those moments, but actually the way she edited it was she just cut them. And I was like, what? And so I, you know, I freaked out. <laughs> and I had to sort of really decide where my own line in the sand was, right? What was I okay changing? What wasn't I okay changing? And how did I, you know, back that up? And my editor, her name is Mega. She is actually a fiction, ed uh, fiction writer. She wrote A Burning. So on top of the fact that she was the, an editor, she is also a writer. Um, a national bestseller writer too. So it was, you know, I just felt like I didn't have a leg to stand on. So there's, I also talk about that a lot, you know, just how, um, how hard it is to sort of figure out your own boundaries and know what you're gonna be okay with doing and what you're gonna be okay like walking away from. Um, and I know a lot of writers who, you know, have had to walk away from projects that, weren't aligned with how they saw their book. Um, so yeah, it's it, it becomes muddy. It becomes muddied, yeah. I felt very grateful to be able to sort of have that relationship with my grandmother in my 30s, right? So I had really known my grandmother uh, for seven, first, first, for the first seven years of my life, and she was in China, so I didn't really get to know her uh, um, growing up. Um, and then I saw her again after my grandfather died, and she moved to the United States. Um, and that's sort of, sorry guys, spoiler alert, that's how the book ends. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I recognize that a lot of what I was looking for with my mother, I had gotten from my grandmother. And I had for, I, what I wanted from my mother was something that my, mother, my grandmother had given me. And so there was a moment where I just realized I had to let go of certain expectations I had of my mother to be the kind of mother that I wanted her to be. And then to recognize that you know, I still had that relationship with my grandmother. And that was, you know, I felt profoundly privileged to be able to experience that in my lifetime. And I think for her too, she just kept, you know, thanking Buddha um, for having, you know, met me again, because I think it made her feel so good to also be in my life and to know that I was okay and well. Um, so that was a huge part of just our reconciliation. Um, she's still alive. She's in Queens. And, you know, um, I call her frequently. COVID has just been so brutal to her. Um, it, you know, she was mobile before and now she's sort of not. There's been a really steep decline. And just because of my relationship with my family, I've not really been, had much access to her. So it's been very painful for me. Um, I'm also in the process of moving um, and moving out of New York. And um, I wanted to see her one last time, but I was very upset to learn the other day that I don't think that's gonna be possible. Yeah, yeah, so heartbreaking, yeah. But you know, there's no happy, I, I mean, it, there's a happy ending in this book where I tried my best to give it a hopeful, ha happy ending. But also, you know, the story also continues. Like, I, I try really hard to teach my students that there's no, you don't need to tie things up in a pretty little bowl um, because life is real and it's okay to depict it as such. Yeah, that's actually something that, again, I was saying that the 
uh, the editorial part is really fascinating because it does end up being a collaboration. So one of the biggest edits that my editor asked of me was to connect labor throughout this entire book. Um, so the first, uh, the first half really deals with sweatshop, but it goes, this memoir travels from sweatshop to startup, right? Um, and you know, you would think that those two have no connections at all. And actually there's quite a few connections. Um, and I also, what was really important to me was I wanted to also relay some of the trauma in which we experience in our household and, and the way in which we take it into the workplace, right? So um, for example, because I was made to work in my, um, in, in this way, and there was also some other level, levels of abuse of just um, a lot of chores. <laughs> so it wasn't, um, so I, it was important for me to capture how our, um, our sense of identity is so attached to the, the way that we're useful and how if that is created early, for example, that um, your worth is based on how much you can do for me or how, clean you can get this apartment or how much work you can do, then that, begin, that begins to be um, a cycle in which is created in, within ourselves and it is repeated over and over again um, until we put a stop to it. So some of the cyclic um, ways in which we internalize the, the abuse or the, um, the ways that our parents treat us and, and the ways we begin to treat ourselves. Um, so, you know, we're often our worst, worst critics because we've internalized some of that worst criticism. Um, so, you know, when I, um, so the startup that I worked for um, went up in flames, basically. And when it went up in flames, I sort of had another moment of like, oh, how did I end up here? And what are some cycles um, that I'm repeating. And so that's where um, some of the labor part came through. Um, yeah. The best piece of advice um, is to keep writing and never give up and to create a routine. So I think, um, you know, I, do not think I'm very talented. I've never thought I was a particularly talented writer. Um, and here I am in front of you guys, right? So it really isn't about talent. Um, whether it was my undergrad program or my MFA program, I would say I was usually surrounded by writers that I felt were better writers than I am. But, um, you know, I showed up every day and I put in the work and I never, never gave up. And I think that is something that I'm constantly also trying to um, talk to my students about, just the um, how long it takes to complete a book, right? How long it takes to write a piece. Um, so this is going to be, a, if you pursue it, it's a lifelong journey. You, you can't be like, it's not, you know, it's not um, destination driven. It is a journey and you have to... Um, do things that um, lift you in that journey. So um, other advice, I, I always talk to my uh, like community, finding people that are also writers. Um, and it doesn't really even matter if they're gonna read your work. It's someone that you can talk to about the process who are on parallel paths. Um, but also it's great to have readers and community in terms of um, you know really understanding how hard this this um, path is, and um, getting ready for that. It's not easy. I think it's glamorized in some ways, and, uh, and it's not glamorous, mostly. <laughs> it's not glamorous. That's a great question. So um, I actually, wouldn't let anyone read the book until it was done. Which means like, I didn't, like my agent was maybe the, the second person that had read the book. Um, and I did that to protect myself. And I didn't recognize it at the time, um, but in hindsight, 
I'm so grateful I did that. Um, and the reason I say that is because um, I think, you know, there is culture in this book, a lot of culture, a lot of culture that is different from the culture we're growing up in, and then there's abuse. And anytime you label anything abuse, there is the, con like, people stop listening. Immediately, it's bad, right? Um, and there's actually a beating scene in here that I, like, put in, took out, put in, took out, rewrote, put in, took out. Um, because I didn't want there to be a physical scene that immediately compelled the reader or anyone and any reviewers to be like, oh, this is abuse, of course, because the, the story is so much more complicated than that. And I wanted the complexity to come out. So actually, I, I would say that there's more withheld from this book than, um, because I don't, I, I'm also someone that believes in um, that we can traumatize readers as well. So I only um, put things in the book where there's certain payoffs. There's a reason for everything um, that's written into this book, and that was really important to me. So absolutely, I would say um, that I was very careful with it, um, partly because, um, back to your question, um, you know, just the idea that um, when I was a kid, I, I told people that there was abuse at home and nobody did anything about it. And, you know, I called child services and they said nothing was wrong. So of course there's definitely a response for me. I'm not gonna, the, you know, so that those were huge. Um, and so I think I internalized a lot of that. And even in grad school, you know, one of, um, you know, this is some time ago, hopefully MFA programs are no longer like this, but one of the um, most common feedbacks I got was, this isn't believable. And that was devastating to me because it had happened to me and now I didn't know how to make it believable, <laughs> right? So it was this conundrum and I, um, and you know, and putting yourself out there is very difficult. So to receive that type of response also struck a chord with me. So I felt very protective of the manuscript. So when I decided I wanted to write it, I really didn't want anyone else to have the ability to alter it when it was in that very vulnerable state. Um, and, you know, after, uh, it was really around year six, um, when I was like, I am done, done with it, and I was ready for feedback, that's when I sort of allowed other people to read it um, and to send it out. And actually, it happened very quickly. So I gave myself a lot of time. But between, so I got an agent. Eight months in, book was sold, uh, book was ready to go out. And then the book was bought in two weeks, which is very, very fast because it usually takes two weeks for someone to read a book. <laughs> um, so I'm really glad in hindsight that I did give myself that time because if I was unsure about it, um, you know, I don't really know what would have happened because it happens very quickly once the book is out of your hands. Thank you for that question. And yeah, I think authenticity is um, something that I'm always striving for and I'm constantly, it, it really doesn't matter, you know, we all suffer from our own types of trauma. It's not about, it's not a comparison game. It's more about the authenticity of that experience and how you're able to express it. Yeah. I'll sit here. I'll stand here all day and talk. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. If we don't have any more questions, feel free to come and chat with me. I'm happy to sign a copy of a book. Um, I bought some swag, some little um, sewing kits. So I think there might be enough for everyone. So on your way out, whether or not you're, you know, buying a book, buy a book. But <laughs> um, also there are little swags. So you remember me. <laughs>